Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us as we start off 2023 in a really wonderful way because we all start off by exploring some tips on how to press your financial reset button. I'm Freddie Bell. You may have heard me this morning. I never stop. We just keep going because my job is to acquaint you with the best possible information we can. I'll do my best not to talk about the weather, but we'll talk about how you can weather the financial storm. You know, for many of us, through no fault of our own, we're unable to move beyond paycheck to paycheck. And yet, for some, the choices that we make play a role in keeping us in that never-ending cycle of debt. Well, joining me today to help us to take a look at our relationship with money, yes, money and you can have a relationship, and offer a few tips on how to improve that relationship, we have an esteemed panel. First, we have Mr. Dan Johnson. He is the Chief Executive Officer, designee of what will become Minnesota's first Black-led community credit union, Arise Community Credit Union. Also joining us is Karen Washington. She's a financial coach and a former banker. And Mr. Benson Webb, the Managing Director of Golden Webb Capital. We only have a few minutes, and we want to make sure that every minute counts this afternoon, this evening. And we'll go right into our topic this evening, and we'll help you to discover how you can press that financial reset button. So first, to each member of the panel, we'd like to get your take on uh, how you would describe our community's current relationship with money. Dan, we'll start with you. Thank you, Freddie. Again, I'm Dan Johnson, uh, the uh, CEO designee for Rise Credit Union. My take on our community's uh, financial relationship is that it's it's a love hate relationship because at certain points things go well, like the beginning of the month or right at payday those first two days, things are good. However, the management of the funds and resources, as opposed to the bills and things that need to be paid, can sometimes have a combative effect. Uh, and it's where paycheck to paycheck, money's not lasting until that next paycheck. And which is really the reason why we're here is to take a look at some other ways to smooth out that relationship to have a better relationship, form a more better, perfect union, if you will, with your finances and not only having them work from week to week, but actually have a plan to save money for larger purchases, things like getting that home and sending your kids to school, that vehicle that you need so that you can get back and forth to work. So the relationship is ongoing, but sometimes I just put it as a love-hate right now. All right, a love-hate relationship. Uh, Karen, I'm thinking about you right now. You're a financial coach. Uh, you've been in the banking business. How would you describe our current relationship with money? Um, I would have to piggyback on Mr. Dan there. It, it definitely is a love-hate relationship. I think um, oftentimes we take the information that we've learned from our parents um, and we we go from there. So if there, there aren't things that are being passed down, we're not utilizing those skills. And so it just comes from a, a place of unknown. And so that's kind of what we want to try to turn around, try to turn around that relationship so that we can have our own personal relationship with our finances, understanding what that means for ourselves, understanding what that means for our children and the longevity of it. Um, as Mr. Dan said, there are some things that come up in our lives, you know, we, we lose people and we need to hit the highway quickly. Where are those funds coming from? Now we're doing GoFundMes. Um, is that the appropriate task for that? Maybe, maybe not. Um, are there other opportunities that we could put things aside to where we can step into that and utilize that when, when those needs arise? But again, if we don't know that information, then we don't utilize it. So um, I would like to see the love-hate relationship change. And I think that we are we're going to kind of tap into that to kind of give some tools to, to do that. All right. Thank you, Karen. And Benson Webb, the managing director of Golden Webb Capital, uh, do you also think it's a love-hate relationship or is it something different? You know, I would love, to, well, first off, thanks for uh, having me and appreciate the introduction, but I would say we are in a love-hate relationship, but I'll also add on that we are a little misguided on how to utilize. We're in the stage, the misinformation age now. 
So everything we want to learn, everything we want to know is at our fingertips. And we have all these people coming in saying, oh, I'm an expert at this and giving half truths to ways to generate generational wealth, find ways to get out of debt. And they're all good ideas, but at the end of the day, we don't have, we're all trying to find the best way to come to peace with our money. And a lot of times we can get caught up in what they may look like. If we look on social media, we see what people we think are successful, what they do, what they have, how they live their lives. But we don't understand that a lot of this is lies. Anybody can come on the internet and say they're one thing and rent a car and pretend they're doing certain things. And we take in, take internalize that, feel that's actually how we have to do things and are misguided. We do things that are in haste and Honestly, we just need to come together and really sit down and come to peace of where we are individually at this current level we are. How do we figure out how to better ourselves so we can better our community? Because it's hard to pour into somebody else when we are half full ourselves. Understood. Both of you said, uh, I'm sorry, Karen and uh, Benson, you said some things that uh, just sparked my interest. We're, we've got a cross section of individuals who are joining our conversation today. And it is a conversation. You mentioned the uh, a generational thing. You mentioned the love-hate relationship. And uh, Karen, particularly, you mentioned uh, GoFundMe. Is Gun GoFundMe uh, just a symptom of today's society and a part of that love-hate relationship that we have? I think it is. I think it has become norm in most recent times to say, um, hey, we need some assistance. Let's, you know, go ask other people to help us in a financial crisis. I mean, it's no different than, let's just be honest, our parents being able to say, we just had an uncle pass away, let's keep him on ice until we can get enough paychecks together so we can bury him. It's the same mentality and the same mindset. Um, it's just today's day, we have a, a tool for it, right? It's the same thing though. What is happening with our generations to where that becomes the norm? Um, why is that? Why are we not talking about um, life insurance? Why are we not talking about um, savings for those kind of things? You know that you have someone who's living a life that might not be, you know, the perfect life. Why are we not planning ahead and putting it, you know, aside $20, $30 per paycheck? Not saying we're trying to wish this person away, but let's plan ahead and doing those things in advance um, kind of changes the trajectory of so that we don't have to use the GoFundMes. Um, but again, if if we're not utilizing the tools or we don't know that they're out there, then that just becomes our norm, right? Interesting. So you, you set up a, a really interesting question and we're getting these from our chats. And if we don't get to all the questions that we see coming up, uh, you can certainly find those on our website. But I'm just curious about, uh, you brought up a concept of needs versus wants. How can people determine the difference, Dan, between needs and wants? Well, needs and wants kind of parse themselves out. Okay, you have rent, you have to eat, you have to have transportation to get to work, and that transportation requires gas. You have to, you have, to have clothing. Uh, you can really break it down to the necessities as opposed to the extras. Extras would fall under... Uh, more video games for the Sega Genesis or your Xbox or that subscription that costs 20 bucks a month that could go toward a life uh, policy for your child that's at an age where you can get a fixed rate that will stay that way and not have to requalify every year. That's a financial product. Our community, a lot of times, aren't exposed to those things and those ideas that say, a little bit of sacrifice goes a long way down the road. So needs to wants really make themselves clear. You don't need to have fast food. You need food. So take a look at what you spend a week on fast food and chart how many days did it feed you. One evening, one meal. After a week, add that up. Take that same dollar amount and go to the grocery store and see how many days that feeds you. It's simple math. You'll see that this dollar amount, this $37 that I spent within eight days, just popping in and out of this place, that place, fed my family and myself. And some of these ingredients last 
for three weeks, good meals for four days. It, and then you can really start looking at that really starts separating needs from wants. Uh, having Air Jordans that cost $175. That wow. is, in my opinion, that is really where we as a community, and not just us, but people that are, are what I say, exposed to marketing really fall for these things. Your feet need to be covered and you need to have proper arches in your shoes and a good vibram on the heels, on the soles, so you don't slip and fall. But you do not, unless you're a professional or you're really seeking that need $175 tennis shoes. So that's these are some, some basic needs versus want examples that people are, grapple with and go through every day. And it's, it's, it's kind of really simple when you just start breaking it down. I have needs and I have wants and Benson, I need my I need my sneakers. I need my tennis shoes. I need my Jordans, man. So I mean, how do I distinguish between them? I need shoes on my feet. Well, I would say really understanding. Well, take a look at back at what industry we're dealing with. We are living in a capitalist society, and we are, there's billions of dollars poured into making you believe that what you want is what you need. So you may think it's hard to really differentiate when you're on TV all the time on social media that the, everyone around you is trying to promote a product that they want you to, to buy from them. So my job is to make you want to buy whatever I sell, regardless of it does what it needs to do for you. I just need your money so I can continue to do what I want to do, which is make more money. So understanding that from the jump helped me because now I'm not looking at everything as, well, I did say I wanted this. I think of it, did I really want this or have I been persuaded by social media? Have I been persuaded by everyone on TV, all the commercials, everyone's trying to sell something? Do are Am I really helping myself or I'm helping them at the end of the day? And then really putting yourself at the center of it and say, okay, if I want to make sure I'm taken care of, and you know, I'm not saying don't enjoy nice things. I like nice things. That's nothing wrong with it, but make sure that you have your priorities and a row and understanding what comes first. You have to take care of your rent, you have to care, take care of your bills, make sure you pay yourself first, make sure you get some money into an emergency fund. So when problems do arise, because we all live, I have yet to see a life that doesn't have problems. So the best things we can do is prepare for those problems ahead of time. And you know, once the bills are taken care of, once you've invested in yourself and invested into your future, if you have a little left over, why not? But when people really sit down and understand where they are and how that their dollars really move, you'll start thinking a little differently about it. And, and I would like to just jump in and say, we need to start bragging on how little we paid for something as opposed to how much we paid for it. That goes to what Karen said and, and also Benson about how social media has gotten our mind thinking, well, I paid 800 for these jeans and I paid, what's your fit cost? Oh, I got this much on this, this much. And that's a bragging point. Whereas we have to change that mentality to say, guess how little I paid for that very same thing that everybody else were. Guess what I got out of the mall spending, how little I had to spend. And of course, you want to have some of the things you want because you only live once in this life. But you don't need, you, I don't think you need to have 10 pair, a thousand pair dollars worth of tennis shoes. <laughs> just don't unless you're a professional player exactly and uh, we're talking about trying to reset the the financial button on this conversation this afternoon and uh we're at the beginning of the year and i'm just wondering karen uh, are there some financial pitfalls that people find themselves at the beginning of, of every year and if there are are there some steps that we can take right now to try to avoid them we're only uh, 19 days in well everyone knows at the beginning of the year we all have a New Year's resolution. I'm going to save more money. I'm going to put this away. I'm going to stop spending. I'm going to work out. Put all those things in perspective, right? What's important? What's a priority? What helps you get to that financial goal? Um, if that is the goal for you. For me, maybe the gym membership at $170 or $75 or how much ever it costs isn't ideal. Maybe, you know, linking with a friend who lives in a, an apartment building and they might have a fitness center in the building connecting. Plus, we know we do better when we group things together, right? So, hey, friend girl, um, I know that our goal was to work out 
are you okay with me coming over on Tuesdays after work and you work out for 30 minutes? And then we, you know, share in fixing each other's salads or, or doing something healthy. So now we're not going out after we work out, right? We're holding each other accountable. We're watching our dollars. We're finding other creative ways to save money and still keep with our goals, which is financial fitness and being healthy, right? For our new year's resolution. Um, some of the pitfalls, as I just mentioned, is signing up for that. Let's go ahead and, and get that membership going. I like to think of it in this kind of tag or segues back to what we were just talking about as far as wants versus needs. When I think about a want versus needs, I think about is it's going to take away from something that is a priority for me. So if I do this uh, membership, what does this take away from? And if the answer is nothing, then okay, I can proceed or I'm going to look at it a little differently. But if I do this membership and I'm like, ooh, I spend $75 on this membership, that's gas, you know, for one time this week, it doesn't work for me. I'm not going to do it. Um, that's what works for me as far as prioritizing those things. And I just um, hope that other people would start to kind of think about it that way as well. Yes, we know that we have the biggest buying power as brown people. Um, it is one of the best kept secrets, but we do. So the advertising and the marketing is on purpose, right? They want our dollars. So if everyone knows that we have a great buying power, why are we not doing what we need to do to secure it and to utilize it the right way? Karen's talking about pitfalls, Benson. What do you say? What do we need to avoid or what are the common pitfalls? we find ourselves in, at, particularly at this time of the year? I would say a major common pitfall that I've realized working with my clients and just realized in my life that we set really unrealistic goals. And they're not bad goals, mind you. But again, we want to put ourselves in a position to win. And if we're trying to walk to the moon by tomorrow, it's just <laughs> possible. Maybe if you take, it takes a couple steps every day to make things happen. So if you decide to say, okay, I want to save $10,000, it will be great to have it by tomorrow. I wouldn't be mad if I had $10,000 pop up on me on tomorrow. But realistically, where am I in my life to where that's possible? Can I save $10 here or there? Can I save $100 here and there to reach that goal? Is that something? And seeing those small wins help your mindset. Because a lot of times our finances are tied into our mindset. And where we are at the time in our minds and how we are in our lives will dictate where our money goes. So if you're trying to do a million and one things at one time, it's a great story at the end of the day, but is it a plausible story? It's a great story because it's not something people do every day, but you want to make it to where small habits turn into big changes in your life. So starting off small, save what you can, build that emergency fund because you do want to be able to start investing let down the road and you don't want to be able you don't want to keep pulling from those investments because maybe you had an emergency pop up that's what emergency funds are for you can put them in high yield savings accounts or you're getting some money back off of the money you're saving up for these emergencies so now you have a little more at the end of the year and then you have these ways to save like i said ten dollars a day hundred dollars a week hundred dollars a month if it's hundred dollars every quarter if that's something you can do make it reach these attainable goals. Because again, the pitfall is that we set, we see so many people doing the things we want to do on social media. We think we have to do it right now. We have to get comfortable with delayed gratification. It might take a year, it might take two, it might take five years to reach your goals. But as long as you make consistent effort every day and putting in the effort you need to to make your certain, like the, excuse me, the lifestyle you want to happen, you will find it'll happen a little bit quicker than you expect. You talked about small wins and our radio station is not that far from a payday lending institution right down the street from KMLJ. And I'm wondering, Dan, how can I, I hear what Benson just said, but how do I get that right in my mind when I can just go down the street, I can get out of this crisis that I'm in, but what's the impact of thinking like that? How can I move from that mindset of instant gratification to having the small wins that Benson just talked about? Well, it boils down to sacrifice. It boils down to a discipline. A lot of times trying to save money and being in a money saving thing is like dieting. And the whole, because <laughs> when you diet, what are you doing? You're cutting down on calories. When you're saving money, you're cutting down on money, leaving your household budget. 
your pocket. So it's a dieting thing. Uh, uh, when you're already in trouble and you need the payday lender, far be it for me to say, okay, if you're going to lose something that took first and last month rent to get into and things like that, you're in a dire situation. There's no family, there's no friends, and you're already there. Then far be it for me to say, hey, whatever lifeline you need to get that isn't nefarious, which they're on the borderline of being almost like a loan sharks. Yes, you may have to grab that. However, just like Benson and Karen said, you need to have a realistic goal after you get out of that so that you're not in that position again. Starting small, I have a plan that I, I showed people when I was at Olson Highway. It started out very small. When you are shelling out at the end of the day to fold your clothes, all the silver in your pocket, it goes in one bucket, put the copper in another. Do that and do that for two weeks. Then you want to graduate. Anything less than a five. Once, put that in with the silver. Now you do that for a month and add that up. That might come to $46. It might only come up to, it might come up to $60. What you do the next month is challenge yourself. I saved $50 over 30 days by shelling out the coins and saving the dollars and uh, dollars. This month, I'm going to challenge it by matching that $50 with $50 right out of uh, out of uh, right out of my pocket, right off the bat. Now I'm going to still throw the coins in. Then you look what you're where you're at at the end of the month. Hopefully, you'll be at a hundred dollars because you will still have the same behavior practices to say that now you're saved a hundred dollars in that second month. What happens when you start seeing that money? It's infectious. It, it does the reverse. Whereas you see a marketing thing. I want to buy. I want to buy. When you see that bucket start building up, you'll start looking at it every day and you'll start throwing a little extra in there. I used to go to bed early sometimes. So I'd say this is all I spent today was 30 bucks. I'm getting to bed by nine o'clock. But again, that's just me going to extremes. But my point is you have to start small and start somewhere. And once you start seeing measurable success, just like dieting, when you start seeing that you're losing weight, that inspires you. That puts wood on your fire to continue to build and grow. And before you know it, you'll start having a much more aggressive savings plan because you can feel it and touch it. Our community sometimes need to feel and touch it and see it right then and there. That makes me think about the song that me goes, you got to walk it like you talk it. But uh, yeah. I'm, I'm still in radio. <laughs> but uh, you, you mentioned the small wins, both of you, Benson and Dan, but I'm wondering, Karen, uh, are all these payday uh, lending institutions hazardous or are the GoFundMe hazardous to what we're trying to do in writing our financial health? Hazardous is a, a, a really strong word. Um, I think it's appropriate to say that, yes, it is hazardous. Um, I like to think that financial institutions serve a purpose. When you go into your financial institution, you would, you would like to think that you have a rapport and a relationship. Those relationships are no different than your friendships, right? You, you come into a crisis, you go to the friend like, hey, Mr. Dan, I, I need to borrow like $20, $30. He's not going to give you $20, $30 if you don't have a relationship. He's going to look at you like you're crazy and give you the resources for something different, right? The same mindset comes with financial institutions. If you don't have a relationship with that financial institution, it's really hard to walk in the door and say, I'm in a crisis. I need to borrow some money. They're going to say, well, who are you? You know, who, who are you? and Why should I loan you my money? Where if you're going to this payday lender, right, you're giving them your check, they're cashing you out, you're paying a high percentage to get whatever you want days in advance. There is no relationship there. You come into a crisis and guess what they're gonna say? Not our problem, give, them, give us our money back on time, please. Thank you. That's how that works. So yes, it is hazardous to us because we don't have that connection. So we find ourselves in this spiral where it just continues and we don't know how to get out of it. And that's why it becomes hazardous. It, it's that mindset again, find that relationship with that financial institution. 
get in there, know who your loan officers are, know who the branch managers are, know who your tellers are, make that relationship. So if you come to hard times and you say, hey, I, I need something, you have all these people have seen you weeks and weeks from cashing your check and coming in there and they're going to say, Karen fell on hard times. She's really, really great. She makes her a deposit. She puts like $40 in her savings account. She just needs a little bit of help. Is there anything that we can do? Now you have that relationship where they're willing to, to try because now we have a little rapport and we have a history now. We can see it in your account. We can see how often you're here. We can see how often you're getting paid. We're a little more, let's say, apt to help versus that reluctancy to send you on to that, that payday lender. Really interesting. And Karen's just talking about relationships, Benson. And uh, my next question has to deal with uh, getting your, your credit together, making sure that that's working out all right. Is it really worth, worth it to pay somebody to repair your credit? Well, it depends. Honestly, if you are in a situation where you are trying to get a quick fix and you don't necessarily know how to do it on your own, maybe consulting with somebody is the best thing, but realize that a lot of the things that you're trying to do it's really a simple thing. You can go in, you can realize, you can learn everything on the internet and they're not really doing anything special per se. A lot of times what they're doing is they're just filing disputes with the creditors, hoping that they, ne they have nothing coming back and they remove it from your credit. That's something that you can do. You can go online, search for a template. And I'm hoping I'm not uh, destroying anybody's business model here just by going and uh, <laughs> exposing these secrets. But a lot of these things are possible on our own and if you are not in a financial position to where you can afford to pay somebody to do it I assure you that you want to do it on your own because a lot of times it might take months it might take longer than you would like to versus you just sitting down finding this information out for yourself googling it youtube and you know whatever it takes and doing it yourself not to say it's a bad industry and I do have a lot of friends who are credit repairists and people that own these own credit repair business. But if you are in a situation where you need to do it and you don't have the funds to pay somebody else to do it, I would suggest going on your own and figure it out because they do provide a service. And as a professional, I believe that you have to pay professionals to get professional jobs done. But again, if you can't afford it and it's, you have the time, I think it would be better to go through the process on your own because not only are you able to learn for yourself you know what you did wrong and you know how to fix these issues now now you went through the you paid time sweat equity into fixing your credit you're going to take a credit a little bit more seriously instead of just handing out somebody and say hey fix this for me and going back to them every time you fix have a problem because it's going to be a continuous cycle and then at that time when they can't help you you'll be stuck holding basically holding the bag as they would say so make sure you understand everything that comes around your credit. Check your credit report. Go to annualcreditreport.com. Check, see what's on there, because you will be surprised how many small things pop on there. Somebody probably used your credit when you were younger. I know sometimes parents, uncles, aunts. Light bill. You throw your light bill on it because you, you got better credit than I do. So I'm going <laughs> to use what you have and then end up throwing your credit all out of whack. So check your credit. Understand credit cards, understand 30 on using 30% utilization under that with your credit cards, making sure you don't overspend, make sure you pay your bills on time. That's the biggest thing, paying your bills on time. If you have uh, collections on your account, figure out a way. Well, first see how long you've had the collection because after seven years, these things do fall off. But understand your credit the best way you can because this is now your adult report card in a sense. And a lot of times you have these D's and L's, people won't be open to lending to you unless we're charging you 30 40 percent apr because we know you have these habits because we have a business model built off a lot of these payday lenders have business models based off the fact that they know you can put yourself in the, you put yourself into this situation because you're not handy with your credit or you don't understand credit well enough and now we're hoping that you don't pay us back we hope we default especially if you have to put a, your car title up we're hoping we can take your car because now we can sell your car. This is a whole business model around us failing. So please, everyone, check your credit. Make sure you understand what is on there. And if you need to talk with a specialist, do so and make sure it's worth your time and money. It's really interesting. I hear Karen talking about building a relationship with the financial institution. 
And then you just said that you can do this by yourself. And as soon as I asked that question about getting someone to help you to repair your credit, Dan, I saw your eyebrow, eyebrow go up. Uh, what's your take on that? What are you thinking? Help me. I, I would have to agree with, with Benson because again, if you, I, if you have a professional and someone that is really going to help you and you need that help and you don't have that resource engine to do it yourself and you're not really ready to research, yes, you can reach out, but as well, they say nowadays with YouTube and the internet, you don't have the right to say, I don't know anymore. No one can say that. So you can actually look these things up, find out what they mean, um, know the difference between a charge off and a sat something being satisfied because it, it's a different reporting to all, you know, trans global and all of it. It's a different reporting. If you satisfy something, it sits better. But if it's just charged off and it finally falls off, you don't get that real credit for that. So if you can, and sometimes these things are, you had a cell phone and you owe uh, $38 on it, you never paid. If that just gets satisfied, it's still in your bucket. It's not good. You, I mean, if that just gets charged off, you need to satisfy these things. Get those things knocked out. And looking at your credit sometimes is like looking underneath your bed where all the shoes and all the plates that you didn't take down to the kitchen, that's where it's at. And until we're ready to face it, you just have to get down there and face it and, and say, hey, we're going to, one thing we're going to do in the new year is face it, clean out from underneath the bed, as it were, to find out really what's going on. And it's a lot of times, it's not as bad as we thought. But when you don't do it, it can mushroom. Yeah, I, I didn't know that you could think underneath my bed here, but uh, Karen, I, I'm wondering. <laughs> uh, I love that analogy, Dan. Uh, as we go to Karen, gotta make it fun. Yeah. So, so when you think about uh, the credit repair, Karen, and we're looking at debt consolidation, uh, how how does it work? How does debt consolidation work? Is it is it really for you, or can it work against you? Well, both. Um, really. Gentlemen, feel free to, you know, chime in um, with me here. From my experience, the credit repair companies, um, they're consultants, right? So they're not volunteers. There's a difference. So no one's going to help you do something without there being something that they're getting from you. So they're going to charge you for the service. And oftentimes, some of the debt that you might have out there might be less than what you're paying this person to do. So looking at that before you even make that decision, right? If I owe, like you said, a $38 uh, phone bill from voice stream or what have you, is it worth me paying a hundred dollars every time I meet with this consultant and I'm meeting with her every other week? Do I have that flexibility or can I be taking that hundred dollars or $200 and applying that towards the debt to get rid of it? or to satisfy it, or to call the creditors and say, I'm ready to make arrangements. Um, so yes and no, but if you, I mean, it depends on your situation. Every situation is unique um, and everyone's timeline is different. If you're in the crunch, you're saying, I went to you know, go for a loan and they denied me and they told me I need to work on this and I'm totally confused on how to do this and I need help and it's worth it, then seek the resources and, and have them assist you with that. So. I guess it's just based on your individual need and where you are with your credit at that point. Vincent, in your opinion, is there a rule of thumb when it comes to uh, debt consolidation? So there, are. so uh, to Cameron's point, you do want to make sure it's something that is financially makes sense for you, right? If you're, let's have that $20 uh, Xfinity bill that you forgot to pay and they're asking for it, just go ahead and pay it, get it out the way. But with debt consolidation, it can be of use, especially if you have multiple debts with multiple APRs that are in a higher range of like 15, 20, 30, 40%. And that might sound crazy, but there are these people that will take advantage of your need to make a dollar. So if you're in a situation where you're paying crazy interest rates on some debt that you may have needed to take out in a pinch, find out what the best debt consolidation move is. Sometimes there are things like Best Egg or uh, going to your local credit union or something similar like that, finding ways to 
work with people around you that are in the business of helping you. So very big on credit unions. They have a lot of uh, debt consolidations out there and they will help you get out of debt to where you're drowning. They won't eliminate debt for you. You still have to pay, you have to pay the credit union or whatever financial institution you're working with back. But if you can lower your APR over time, you can save more money. Hopefully you can understand how you got to that point. You can work towards not doing there anymore, getting to that point anymore and having one central location where you can spend your bills and hopefully that can help you. But again, it can be a cash 22 because now you have that credit that was venture that was locked up because you had to pay it back and that was back open. How are you going to stop from overspending again to get back in this situation? So, and if you're not at a point where you're prepared and you haven't understood or went through the trials and tribulations to say, okay, I don't need to do this anymore. Let me do better money habits. You're going to end up back in the same position, but with a lot more debt that you took out. And now what, where have you gone? So if you're going to do it and you're going to use a lot of debt consolidation, make sure this is the last time you have to go out and do it. It sounds like uh, both Karen and Vincent are making a case for debt consolidation being a foe. Do you agree, Dan? It's not a friend? It's both. I mean, uh, it, 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 it's both. The thing is, is the debt consolidation just gets you to that restart. When you consolidate and you get everything, you get a plan to pay this off because ultimately people have to realize everything in life that you do that are large purchases, all that is, is you're buying dollars. Money costs money. So you get a mortgage for $250,000. They're not going to just say, okay, divide that by 30 years and pay me. No, there's interest. You're, you're buying dollars. It's, and as long as we break it down to that, you want to make sure this debt consolidation will make sure that the dollars that you have to buy, the dollars that you borrow on short term on credit cards are at the lowest amount possible. You're paying the least amount for the money that you're getting in lieu of payment later, which is what our system is built on. It's built on credit. But the smart group of people and people that are doing better, they're getting their money for less because it's just buying dollars. Debt consolidation has helped a lot of people. And it's also, um, it, 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 you just have to have, just like anything, if you're gonna go and use um, someone to redo your floors or a carpet cleaner, you have to get the right one. You just have to do your research, see who's uh, got some good Yelp reviews and any research that you do for anything that you really like, do the same for something that's going to be, you know, like a pill to swallow and then go about it. But it's good and bad. I, I think it has its place. Okay. You know, you mentioned, uh, Dan, you mentioned credit cards and so forth. Uh, a lot of folks are, they have too much month at the end of the money. And they use prepaid uh, debit cards to relieve to get to that money a little faster. Uh, what's the harm in doing something like that? Uh, is is this an option that we're is this an option to everyday banking that and it works for a lot of people? But uh, I'm hearing that there are some downsides to it as well. It 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 boils down to not always, but it's a real indication of money mismanagement. You, if you get paid on Friday, things that you've done since that Saturday till that Friday should manage that money. You, you should walk in your truth as to what you have and what you can spend. But when you have a thought that, oh, well, I'll get my money. I got paid on Wednesday. I even saw a, a commercial where she says, I'm texting by noon that I got my money uh, two days before payday. So you're letting people know you got money early and it's mm -hmm. money that really isn't, shouldn't be available until Friday. You're putting yourself in a hole before payday. You could really be broke before you get paid. It's, wow. it, if you can avoid that at all, that would be the first disciplinary step that someone could say, my part of my plan for 2023 is that I won't access my funds until they're liquid available in my account. That's my first step. 
I no longer am spending my money, three fourths of it before Friday. And then it's small victories. You keep moving that. You keep moving that forward like sticks for first down, first down, first down. You keep doing thing after thing after thing to reel it in. Because again, nothing's for free. That money is available, but it's coming out of your pocket. I had sometimes when I worked at this other place, you could get money before your check came in, but they had an, a, a huge interest rate. I was gonna say usurious, but usurious just means an extremely large interest rate uh, that is just unreasonable. And they mm. charge that rate. So it, it, I, I really do think that the first step is to try to avoid that, really. Dan says we should try to avoid it. Kieran, is it a friend or a foe getting that uh, money early through a credit card or uh, can I say Wells Fargo? No, that's the commercial that did it, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. But what do you think? What, what do you think, Karen? It brings it back to that, that old saying, I know we all heard it, we all grew up with it, um, putting the cart before the horse. That's kind of that mentality. I mean, how do you know you're still gonna be employed there on Friday? Which is why they're willing to take that huge risk on you by that huge interest rate because they don't know your situation. Two weeks ago, you could have given your notice. Now you're supposed to get paid on Friday and there may not be that paycheck. So it is a risk. Um, again, my banking hat tells me that's, that's not a, a smart idea. But if you're in a dire situation, like Dan was saying earlier, and it's necessary for your situation, um, I mean, you have to do what you have to do, I guess. But it would not be something that I would recommend anyone doing. Um, it, it's just not a smart practice because how are you going to get yourself out of that hole? If, you know, that job that you have or that you were anticipating on having on Friday, that's going to take care of that check for you. What if that doesn't come through? What if the business goes belly up? They close their doors without notice. There isn't the check coming into the account. Now, what are you going to do? How long is it going to take you to get that money back to this payday lender or uh, the advance on this card? What, you know, what does that look like? And again, we all know that we fall short, you know, because we're not reading the fine print in those disclosures. We're not taking the pamphlet and flipping it over when we're doing this agreement stuff. We just sign a little thing on eDocs and we, we keep going. Well, those little things and those disclosures are what keep us in this, this hole. You didn't read it. So guess what? It's going to cost you. And guess what we also get to do? We get to take your car and we get to shut this down and we get to, you know, charge NSF fees on here. And guess what? Now you can't get a checking account anywhere because you messed up here with us. So again, is it worth it? To me, no, but, you know, you gotta do well, what you gotta do sometimes. That's really interesting. I think that might, this might be a learning for a lot of folks on the conversation this evening, Vincent. So are, am I hearing that there is a charge to get your paycheck early, even through a big institution like U.S. Bank or Wells Fargo? It definitely is. Again, you're not going to get, it's, there's no such thing as free money out here. It just doesn't <laughs> happen. And if you're expecting to get some free money because you have a job, they're going to hope you don't. Because again, this is a business around everything. And I keep repeating this because I want this to be something that people retain is that people are in business to take your money. Their businesses aren't your friends. Your money is their friend. Your money is their best friend. And they're trying to hold on to your money as long as possible. So our goal is to hope that, you know, you never catch up. We hope that every time your check comes, we get it before you do. We, you don't pay yourself. You're going to pay Uncle Sam and then you're going to pay us. Figure out, rest, do what the rest you need to. But hey, if you need a little bit of extra help, we got you. That's how they keep you in there. If I can keep taking away from you so you have to keep taking away from me, that's a bad relationship to have. And you're going to be out on the outside just saying, how do I keep up? What do I do? And this is all by design. So understand that again. Again, life is at a point where you're just unpredictable. No one predicted COVID-19 happening. No one predicted the recession. No one predicted these things. And now the consumer debt limit has risen. There's people have extended their debt to the point where they're overcharged or not overcharging, overcharging, where they're spending more than what's on their debt limit. There's a rise in all of this and it's by design because we were not prepared. So we have to start looking to the future because the whole payday lender and uh, cash check, check cash in place, their goal is to say, hey, as long as you have emergencies, we're gonna be here for you. It's gonna cost you, 
but we're going to be here for you. And if you have a plan to where you say, okay, I know I'm going to get a bonus or I'm going to get my taxes or I'm going to do something that's going to bring an influx of income to where I can pay this off before all these fees and APR hits me, then okay, you have, you beat the system, you won. But a lot of times we're not in those situations. A lot of times we're just trying to make it to tomorrow. And these instant cash, check casting places, they're here to satisfy that, that desire to have it right now because you may have to have it right now. Your kids may be sick. You have to pay for the doctor's bill. You might have a flat tire. You need to get to work. You need your car. There are small things that pop into place that forces us to have to go to these institutions to where their predatory lending practices are in place. But again, if we can find a way to build, and this is why we have to reset now and focus on building an emergency fund. That's one thing I want people to have. Before you can do anything else, you have to get that emergency fund saved up. And I know a lot of times it's hard when we're living paycheck to paycheck. I understand. I have been through it. Please believe me. This isn't me just coming saying, sitting at the top of the hill saying, looking down saying, hey, you guys can get your life together. No, this is someone who's been in that position and it's hard to get out. But if you don't put a plan in place say, okay, I'm going to do the hard stuff. I'm going to put myself in a position to win. I'm going to start saving a little bit more and not spending on everything. I'm going to pay down this debt. Then you will find those little wins coming into play. Like, okay, I can do this. I'm not drowning anymore. I can get myself into a position that helps. And sometimes it may be finding those other institutions that help, help you understand how to get into that better position. But I believe the saying that, uh, God put everything the acorn needs to become a mighty oak tree within it. So a lot of times we have the power to be in the position that we want to be in, but we just have to stop to reset, take a step back and say, okay, let me see where I am. Let me just take a, ta a tally of where I am and take a tally of where I want to be. What is that road from A to B that I need to reach to get to that point? And at that point, you will feel a lot more confidence because a lot of times we don't have we don't have the mindset to think ahead like that. We're thinking, what's what I'd have to do tomorrow? Today was rough. I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I'm not I'm not secure. I'm not prepared. But having that emergency fund, having get having ways of debt consolidation, having those debt pay down strategies, utilizing these things to give you a sense of mind. Like, okay, I can do it. I don't need to run to the next instant cash place to get some money because I know if I continue to put some money aside, I'll have it for these emergencies. If I keep putting money aside, I'll have to pay down the debt. If I keep putting the money aside, I can eventually get to where I want to be. But it's just really having to, really with the belief and understanding like, yes, it's going to be hard. It's just going to, we're just going to call it what it is. It's going to be hard, but please believe that you all can do it. And we all can do it. Listen, I feel like you've got uh, your arm around our collective shoulders as you're, as you're talking about this. And uh, I'm just curious, uh, Dan, how do you, how do we make our money work for us? And uh, you, all three of you have mentioned it uh, really quickly. Explain APR. I know a lot of folks are wondering what's APR. What's APR, and how do you make that money work for you? APR is an acronym that stands for annual percentage rate. It's the annual percentage rate of any of monies that you will pay. The annual percentage rate. Annual meaning a year. So that's what the acronym stands for. Okay. Um, how do you make your money work for you? Yes, sir. Is that that's a very good question, and it starts it it starts with really uh, at an embryo state. Money works for you when one you can hold on to it. When you can hold on each week from the plans that Karen and Ben have been talking about stair-stepping to where you hold on to more of your resources, that is empowering. You can then take that and put it into a money market savings. They're not paying great interest right now. However, it beats a blank. It beats What's a money market. A money market savings account is a savings account that's going to yield a little more interest than just a regular savings. A lot of times these savings accounts have a threshold on a dollar amount of a minimum balance. That's why the in-home saving plan that you can do disciplinarily through a period of time will give you that point to where you can bring it in to avoid the fees. You'll have your, some of them say you have to have a $300 balance. So do your savings plan at home, get it up to $300.
then put it in a money market savings, which right now I think is paying about. Some places will give you, if you're at a credit union, you might even get 1%. But even in a bank, it's 0 0.32 or something. But again, it's, at that point, it's better than having it in the ice cream bucket. <laughs> and once, once you start continuing to add to that, you're going to want a time account. A time account, a little six month time account. Now that's when you get into better interest. You're talking about, I've seen it as high as 3.5%, 4% for six months. And that's something you can start with as little as, uh, I think one started at 500 or $1,000. And then you leave it alone. And those time account agreements are that, yeah, you don't want to take it out. And the good thing about time accounts, uh, Freddie, it's guaranteed. It is not a risk. It's not like, well, you know, you're rolling the dice with this. You're guaranteed to be paid that 3.5%, that 4%. And again, that's just graduating from that small payment from just throwing the silver and the copper in one bucket onto the dollars, onto the money market, onto taking that money, putting it in a time account. And then from there, you just start thinking about financial advisors and moving further. Well, you know, Dan, it sounds like... Um... You're talking about budgeting. Is that what I'm hearing, Karen? That's exactly what I was going with that. It starts from budgeting, having that understanding right off the top. Kind of go back to that, you know, saving that 10% and putting it back into the church. You do that before you do anything else, allocating those funds first, doing the same thing with your budget, right? So you know that you have this goal, taking that out before you, you do anything that's out of it. So you're not touching it. It goes into that. There's a, a product available for a, a local credit union. It's um, kind of one of the products that Mr. Dam was talking about, a high yield savings, but it's more like a, a holiday account, if you will. You put your money in, it has a higher interest rate. If you touch it before the time where you're allowed to touch it, they penalize you, i.e. don't touch it, <laughs> right? And then they open up that, that product for you so that you can use it around the holiday time. Um, when I was working at that financial institution, I would encourage people this is just the jump start to your January because it would open up right around the holiday season. So this is your jump start to January. So when this opens up, take out your twos and fuse and take care of you know, your holiday stuff, then put it right back into this account and let's start you know, moving forward for next year. Now let's double this. So that's how you make your money work for you, using the tools and resources that are available at our financial institutions and um, getting that jump start. And then being disciplined about our, our budgets, right? You're getting Prime pulled out your account. You're you're doing DoorDash and all these other things. Are these necessities or what are what are we doing? Is it a need or is it that want again? Um, and if you're like, oh, I'm spending way too much money here. Yep, reallocate those funds, put those into your savings, and you'll watch your money grow. A lot of this sounds hard. I can see folks kind of. Eh. So so how how do we? Vincent, how do we eat? Well, I want to ask you, how do we ease into this? But can you ease into it? Dan was just talking about the buckets here of silver, the buckets of gold, buckets of paper money. And how do you do this, Vincent? Can you ease well, into it? You can definitely ease into it because if you don't ease into it, it's going to be rough. Okay? Because again, it's all about having the time in place. And if you're constantly bringing transactions in and out of the account, it's going to be hard to let time take, do its thing on the money you're trying to save. Because that's where the generational wealth, that's where real wealth comes from, putting your money in places that provide you APR. Because now you're on the flip side. Now someone else is paying you APR for putting your money up. And now you're getting some of that interest back. Now you're seeing your money grow because your money has to work somewhere. Your money's not going to work for you just sitting out of these accounts or investments and things of that nature, you have to be able to put the money, you have to let your money work for you. And how do you do that? Small way, start small. Again, save $10, put $15 a week, say, hey, I'm starting off with this. Yes, it may be small, but if you're living paycheck to paycheck, just having something to hold on to, say, like, this is mine, I'm working to hold on to this. And as I continue to grow within this, I will be paid off in the end. Now your instant gratification doesn't even bother you anymore. You're like, okay, I don't mind waiting because I want to see how far this thing can grow. Because now 
20 years down the line, 30 years down the line, you're saying, okay, this $5 a day contribution I was making has turned to 50, has turned to a hundred dollars a day. And now I'm sitting back and I can really focus on the bigger picture of things. How do I make sure I start saving for my children? How do I start investing for my children? How do I start investing for my grandkids, my nieces, nephews, people in your life that you care about? Because now you've had the self-discipline to control your overspending because now because now, and I will give a small uh, incident, incidental about myself, how I got into investing in savings because I had a bad, horrible spending habit. Like I would just, it's like money would scare me. I would just throw it away at something. I just had to get it off. I would just spend it, spend it, spend it and be like, I don't know what happened. At the end of the, at the, end of the month, I'm like, what happened to my money? But I had in somewhat of an itch to spend money. I just like spending. So I tricked myself and said, okay, I'm spending Instead of spending this money on shoes, spending money on food, spending money on things that don't provide me value, I'm spending money on my future. Now I'm putting money in my savings account and I'm seeing it grow. I'm putting money in my investments. I'm buying stocks. I'm saying, okay, this is here. It's growing. This $50 has turned this $55, small things, but I've bought my future. I'm buying, using the money I have now to buy my future for later. And it scratched that spending itch. So now I'm focusing on, okay, I got a little money for my job. How much can I put away to, once I pay all my bills, how much can I put away? After I've taken care of all my debts, I've taken care of all my obligations, how much do I have left over to speed this itch? And you know, if you set up a plan, you don't need to have a million dollars saved up every day. You can start small because eventually it gradually grows. And as it continues to grow, you'll say, okay, if, and then that's where Dan said, you have to go start with financial advisors say, okay, what's my plan? How do I know if I want to be, say, a millionaire by retirement? How do I do that? What does it take? And you'll be surprised that there's not a lot of money to it. It's, it's substantial if you haven't saved before. It's substantial if you never thought about investing. But as time goes on, you're saying, okay, I'm still living the lifestyle I want. I'm still living my, I'm living the same way. But now I just know by the time I'm ready to settle down and say, okay, I'm done. I don't have to continue to work because I didn't pay my pay for my future in the past mm -hmm. oh you, you know, know it's, no sorry to cut you off and those pro no problem i'm just looking at our clock and each of you have talked about a lot of different uh, ideas and ways that we can really reset the financial uh, button this year as we start out the year 2023 it's hard to say that but if it, we just have a few seconds left i'm wondering if you could leave us with one strategy if we did nothing else uh, for the next 60 days or so, or even for the next year, uh, each of you, we'll start with Dan, what would that one resourceful strategy thing that we can do, as my grandfather would say, right now, right now, action steps? Right now. I would say one of the, one of the, just something real quick and fast, DoorDash, <laughs> all of this fast food, I'm still in my video stomach. games. <laughs> If you could just really say, look at the overcharge on that and just cut that out for two months. Yes, sir. Give yourself two months of no DoorDash, two months of maybe not buying another game for your game box and, and paying yeah. all that money into that. And two months of maybe once a week, because if you have kids, I know you can't always cook. So, so I'm not going to try to act like you can cook, 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 cook but maybe once a week for the fast food and cut that down. If you could do that right away, I truly believe you'd see a substantial difference in your bottom line. All right, Karen, strategy. We, what we back to right the, now. Yes, the old school way of banking. Get that, that ledger. Believe it or not, they still exist at your financial institutions. So get that ledger, write it down. Writing it down, I know there's apps that take care of that as well, but writing it down makes you responsible, right? You got to pull it out. You got to write it down. You got to look at it. Then you add it up and you're like, ooh, yeah, I don't want that too much. So uh, for that two months that you're doing what Mr. Dan said, now you're looking, you're being held accountable for your spending. Once you see it, it, it touches your brain a little differently and you'll start to make those adjustments. You can see where you can cut back. You see where your repetitive spending habits are and... Um, Make some changes. Vincent, you have the last word right now, my friend. <laughs> so I, I'm going to go along with the theme that is here is have a plan for okay. 2023. It's time to really sit down and say, okay, 
I'm not, if I'm not where I want to be, what do I need to do to get there? And finding that number to find that piece, because right now, once we're going into the recession and we're going into where we are now as a, in, in the marketing as a world right now, figure out what it's going to take to make you feel, okay, I don't have to worry because that stress and that worry is going to blindside you to a lot of things that are going on in your life and make it harder for you to focus on the future when you're afraid for tomorrow. So really sit down, look at your expenses. And I know this, it might sound a little hard. It might sound scary. Hey, you got to rip that bandaid off. You just have to go in, realize what you have to do to get to where you want to and make the change. You're not where you are right now. You have to do what you have to do to get to where you want to go. And it will be, and it may be the hardest thing you have did, have done in your life. Mm -hmm. But if it's the hardest thing you have done in your life to change into a life you want to live, just go ahead and do it and get you an emergency fund. Make sure you understand because it will have so much peace where you know that the next emergency won't bankrupt you. The next emergency won't have you run into the payday lenders to get a loan and putting yourself in more debt. Don't be a slave to don't be a slave to debt. That's the last thing we do. It's time to get that financial freedom. And it starts with you and understanding how you need to go. All right, Dan and Benson and Karen, thank you so much. I got to go over to Deborah Hurston, who is the executive director of ABEP. Uh, can you uh, take us out with some next, our next events, the next steps? And I know there've been a lot of questions. We didn't get to all of them. I tried. I'm sorry that I didn't get to everybody, but can you help us out and tell us what's next? Oh, absolutely. First, I want to thank our panelists. That was absolutely fascinating, um, extremely informative. And I was checking off things I needed to do, uh, like make my money, make money. I think we're, 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 we're ready to go down that lane as opposed to having to just sit and, and um, just not work for me. Um, but this program was very personal to me because I've taken the journey that some of our as that some residents uh, in our community are currently taking. And I wanted to take the shame away from it to give people tools uh, to deal with those day-to-day -day challenges. And thank you all for helping us do that. And thank you, Freddie, uh, for hosting this program for us. And for anyone who's, who did put information, the questions in the chat room, and we didn't get a chance to address them, we will be addressing them. We'll send them to the to the panelists so that they can address them and we'll post them on our social media and website. And also, if you are interested, if you'd like to stay on the list to receive notices about our future programming, um, please go to our website um, and put in your information. I did put the website uh, link in the chat room. And also, the Association for Black Economic Power is the organization that's bringing in Minnesota its first Black-led credit union. We are so close. We have a meeting with the regulators tomorrow, and we have a meeting with the regulators in about two weeks with regard to the credit union. We are extremely close, but we still need the community's voice. They're still asking for more surveys. So there's also a link in the chat room that will take you to the community survey. The regulators want to see more people complete that survey. So not only do we need you to complete the survey, but to also uh, let your friends, uh, tell your friends about it and ask them to do the same thing. And when you look at this list of our coming uh, programs, if there's something on there that, 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 if there's something not there that you would like to see, please don't hesitate to reach out and let us know. So thank you so much uh, again, everyone, for making this uh, our first program of this nature a success. And um, we look forward to doing the same next month. All right. Thank you, Deborah, and thank you, everyone. I believe we're at the conclusion. It's just after seven o'clock. And thank you so much for being with us. And I'll see you tomorrow morning on the radio. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>